Okay, we have something a bit weird today. This here is a Maxutov Cassegrain telescope. And we will be using this Maxutov Cassegrain telescope for deep sky astrophotography, which, you know, it's not your typical use case for these types of telescopes because they typically have a small ish aperture. This one is 5 inch or 127 millimeters aperture, but a long focal length. And this guy has a focal length of 1500 millimeters. <laughs> so <laughs> quite a long focal length for, for such a tiny little piece of scope. It's also very light at around three kilograms on its own like that. So f11.8, 1500 millimeters focal length, it zooms in a lot. So this is the SV Boni MK127 or MK127. And this is a very interesting scope for in a lot of respects because it has this, you know, default specs and it comes with all of the advantages of a MacCAS type of telescope, meaning it's really good for visual, planetary and lunar. It's also a pretty decent scope for solar system astrophotography, although I'm not an expert on that, so I haven't really tried that out. Uh, I have tried the visual though. But what makes it really interesting is that it comes with a very unique type of accessory for such a MacCast telescope, and that's this little thing here. If that looks like a reducer to you, it's because it is. <laughs> It is a reducer for this MacCAS uh, telescope. It is actually a 0.65 times reducer, meaning that your focal length goes down to uh, 980 millimeters and your focal ratio goes down to a still slow, but still faster 7.8, f7.8 focal ratio. Uh, but that means that you can have potentially a tiny telescope that can still have a lot of reach and be usable for deep sky astrophotography, so for galaxies, as long as you use very small sensors, I would say at most, the largest sensor that I would use with this is maybe the 533 sensor. I've been testing it with the 585 sensor, which is even smaller. And that's not all that's unique with this uh, little thing. One thing as well is that if you look at the front, normally when you look at something like a Skywatcher Mac 127, you have a dot, an aluminum dot kind of on the, uh, the front lens of the telescope. This is not the case here. And actually I have a way to remove a cover here and it reveals three sets of collimation screws at the front there for a separate secondary mirror because yes, this is a Rumac style Max Tuff Cassegrain telescope. And the collimation is done via three sets of push-pull screws. So you have a black screw and then a silver screw at, at three angles on this uh, secondary mirror. Uh, the black screw is the push screw, the silver screw is the uh, pull screw. And I've done the collimation with that uh, under the stars, and it was pretty close to a good collimation when I got it, but not quite there. So I had to do uh, collimation changes with this, and it felt exactly like working with a standard Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. So this is a user collimatable uh, telescope using the secondary mirror there. And by the way, the uh, secondary, I've measured it at a diameter of 40 millimeters, which means that uh, this telescope seems to have a secondary uh, obstruction of 31% roughly of by diameter, which is actually pretty small compared to Schmidt Cassegrain type telescopes like a Celestron C5 or even C6 have larger percentage per uh, diameter than this thing does. So that's a good point. At the same time, and I don't know if uh, SV Boni wants me to show this, but it can be unscrewed fairly easily. So if you ever have dust within the tube that's on your uh, objective lens, you can actually unscrew it and then screw it on afterwards again before redoing the collimation. Okay, now I need to be very careful putting that cover back on. But there we are. We have the um, secondary mirror or the se secondary mirror screw cover back in place. But wait, there's more <laughs> because this telescope also has, you can see it here, a dual speed focuser. So I can have a, this moves the entire mirror. And by the way, I didn't really notice much, if any, mirror shift, at least on my sample. So you have the rough focus here and the fine focus here. Now, something that is quite interesting to me is that this is a very short space. So there's no way that I can find to fit an electronic focuser here easily, but there is a dovetail plate, like a guide plate, like for a guide scope here, which means that you could potentially try to have 
uh, a focuser here with a timing, timing belt that goes to the rough focus, and the rough focus has actually indentations that are perfect for a timing belt. But obviously I wasn't able to do that, so I just used a bat enough mask to keep this in focus. And I gotta say, the fine focus, I mean, it's very, very smooth. And in particular, the fine focus was really a pleasure, an absolute pleasure to work with. And uh, for on my batten of mask, basically doing like a small movement with the fine focus really moved the central spike of the star just a tiny bit. So it was delicious to actually get into uh, perfect focus. As you can see this is actually a very well thought out telescope. Um, the only drawback that I saw out of the box is that if I shake it a bit, yeah, the <laughs> The dust cover comes off, but obviously that's a very easy fix. Just get some felt paper, add one layer in there, and then it's gonna, it's gonna fit well onto the telescope. Okay, so I do have some results of deep space imaging with that. I'll show you the actual rig in a moment, but I want to say that I did use it with a two inch diagonal because it also comes with an adapter for a two inch uh, diagonal and all of the thumb screws uh, that you need. Uh, because I don't even have a 1.25 inch diagonal. That's the one that comes pre-installed, but it comes again with the two inch adapter as well. So two inch diagonal, a two inch 26 millimeters eyepiece. And you know, I, I after collimation, I put it towards the moon and also towards Saturn. So like if you've ever done visual planetary with a Schmidt Cassegrain or a Max Tuff telescope, there's a moment where you're moving the focus knob and suddenly the focus like snaps into place. It just, I don't know how to describe it. It's a magical moment. If your telescope is not perfect or it has issues, let's say, you will, or it's not well collimated, it will not snap into place. It will like, the, the focus will become less and less and less fuzzy and then more and more and more fuzzy. And you'll have like an area of decent focus, but you don't get that feeling, of that, that actually wonderful feeling of snapping into place. And this one, gave me this feeling at like out of the box after I did a little bit of collimation. Of course, we have the usual stuff, like we have a Vixen dovetail plate uh, here that looks to be around 20 centimeters, which is nice. And uh, we have also two uh, finder scope shoes that are available. Uh, for me, I used uh, one of them for a guide scope and the other one for uh, my Gaius S2 computer to control everything. By the way, for me, it came in this box, so you don't have any carry case with it. Uh, because the price is also pretty reasonable. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. You don't get a carry case with this, but the box itself is actually small enough, but I think it can be reused pretty well as a carry case when you need it. So just, you know, don't throw the box away. Okay, so now let's talk about price. How much is this thing? The list price of this thing is 873 US dollars. I do believe it's shipped from China. I have no idea what it would be in the United States after imports. But as I'm looking at it right now, it's actually on sale for 480 US dollars. Yeah, I mean, 480 US dollars, kind of a no brainer, even if you're just going to use it for just visual and you know planetary, uh, in my opinion. It's a very nice scope and it is, I think, cheaper at this price than something like the Skywatcher uh, 127 millimeters max stuff Cassegrain with, you know, better features. Uh, but I need to show you first how it looks with my uh, equipment, my camera attached to it, etc. And I need to show you the results of that under the stars. So let's get to that. And here is the telescope ready to image deep space astrophotography targets where I have the reducer actually placed here and then my usual imaging train with my uh, 585 sensor camera, a guide camera on an off-axis guider and I'll get back to it in a moment. But the point is, is now I'm at 7.8 on a Maxitov Cassegrain telescope with a small sensor, the 585. Otherwise, yeah, I wouldn't go very much past the 533 because you'll see the results. Uh, in a moment, uh, but this looks like a normal telescope, except that it's weird that this is a Max Tuff Cassegrain and I have 980 millimeters of focal length. That's pretty good. That's a lot of zoom into the target. So for things like galaxies, this is awesome, but that's how it looks with my standard imaging uh, stuff. But you might have noticed that I have this uh, second guide camera with a guide scope here, right? What is this doing here, even though I already have an off-axis guider? This is because while the off-axis guider worked, the uh, star shapes in it 
were getting like crosses, basically, like tiny crosses, and they were also quite getting quite faint. And uh, so for PhD2 in a light polluted sky, like here in Tokyo, it was difficult to actually lock onto a star in a reliable manner, especially since I've had like a lot of high thin clouds all through summer here. If you were in Bordel 5, Bordel 6 zone, I don't think you'd have any issues, but for me it was a limitation and therefore I was using a separate guide scope with guide camera. So with that, let's get to the computer, check some results out. Before that, you can like the video, it really helps the channel out. Leave a comment down below, is this something that you would consider to buy? And if you want to support me even more and you're planning on buying anything from SV Boni, like this thing, or Agena, High Point Scientific, even Amazon, if you do so after clicking one of the links that I have down in the description, it will help me out at no cost to you. And if you want to sponsor the channel directly, make these videos directly possible, you can become a channel member. It's the join button next to the subscribe button or a Patreon supporter. The link is down in the description. Some of my Patreon supporters have access to my videos early and without ads. And I also have a Patreon only for now Discord server running there. Anyway, with that, let's look at the results. Okay, I'm on my PC and we can look at the results of some deep space astrophotography with this little uh, Maxtov Cassegrain telescope with a reducer. It's not every day that you hear that. But anyway, here I have on my computer the result of a single 30 seconds frame on uh, M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. Um, and I wanted to show a single uh, exposure just so that you could see that without calibration, this is uncalibrated, the corners aren't really bad at all. Although, I mean, of course it's a small sensor, it's really made for small sensors, uh, but the corners are fine. The darkest corner is 83% brightness compared to the uh, center around the nebula, like not within the nebula. So that's actually very reasonable. Uh, although I mean, it's not reasonable when you think it's a, such a small sensor, but for the purpose of this gear, I think it's perfectly fine. And we have M27 quite large in our sensor, which is uh, really nice. And the star shapes, they're not too bad actually, but you can see that very quickly, I'm not gonna go into the details of the star shapes, but very quickly in the corners, they start to be a bit out of whack, right? And we have this weird like halo there. I mean, this is not great, but it's not horrible either, I guess. Uh, and we can look at the stack of just 20, 30 seconds frame because that's the sky conditions these days have not been good. Also, my flat panel is kind of dead. It's no longer flat at all. And so I am not able to get good flats these days. Uh, so yeah, anyway, this is a stack. And again, we see the nebula like quite clearly at the center and the center stars there, fine. I mean, if, you, if I were to show you that, I think you'd be okay. The, the stars are a little bit fuzzy. They have this, this slight, halo around them and uh, that could be due to some slight focus shift maybe or also the fact that this is a Maxtov Cassegrain it means it takes forever and in summer it might actually never cool down throughout the night uh, so yeah this is something to uh, to keep in mind this is probably like the worst conditions that you could be testing this telescope at and again you know if we look if we zoom in if we pixel peep at the corners I mean yeah the stars are definitely not perfect at all but you know they're not horrible considering that this is really not meant to be just for deep space astrophotography this is a visual and planetary scope first and foremost anyway we have this example here and another example would be uh, NGC 7331 with the uh, the supernova that's going on so we have the result of a single frame here uh, with the galaxy at the center, the, neb the supernova is, uh, is there. And we have much fewer stars on this image, but we can see roughly the same things, right? The stars in the corner are not that amazing. And we can see they're definitely getting stretched uh, here and there as well. You know, it's, uh, there's fewer stars, so it's a bit less visible than the previous image. And at the center, it looks pretty nice, but you know, it definitely has its, uh, its limitations there. And if we look at the uh, full stack of, uh, of this, I think it was like four hours of data of 30 second exposures. We can see the stars in the center and the full stack are actually, I would say like slightly hazy, right? Uh, but then again, it's like super hot in Tokyo. There's a lot of seeing problems on my rooftop during the night. 
So I don't know whether I should fault the telescope for that. And in the corners, the star shapes start to kind of get less good. But actually, it looks actually better than uh, M27 for whatever reason. Just to show you how uh, this looks when uh, processed, you know, it looks like this in the end. Uh, this is just four hours of data in Tokyo in terrible conditions with hazy skies, poor seeing, etc. But we can see this supernova there. We can see the galaxy. It's all, I think, pretty cool and pretty nice uh, with this telescope. Although, again, this is not the primary use case. I did get a second point of data from K Bill Astro, one of my Patreon supporters. And K Bill Astro also used this very same telescope. I mean, not the very same, but let's say the same model of telescope to uh, take an image here of the same galaxy from a much better Bortle zone. And the interesting thing here is that this was taken uh, without any collimation adjustment of the telescope. The tracking also isn't perfect in many of his, uh, his frames, uh, but we can see some of the same issues with the stars. Sorry, I haven't debayered, but you can see the halo there around the stars in the corner. This is all like very consistent between telescopes, but this one, interestingly, is out of the box, no collimation done uh, whatsoever, and it gives us a second data point. Uh, thanks, thank you so much to my Patreon supporter, K Bill Astro, for really uh, providing that. And he definitely has better sky conditions than I do, that's for sure. Uh, the stars, again, are a bit uh, fat, maybe a slightly fatter than mine, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, this looks overall quite, uh, quite good. This, by the way, is the final processed image uh, from him, from uh, K Bill Astro. So that's all, and I think that's really, really nice. I mean, this looks okay, right? I mean, more than okay, to be honest. I'd be very happy to have this image, and we do see the supernova here. And so that's for the experimental results on Deep Sky, which is not the main scenario, again, for this telescope. It's just a bonus. You get a Maxutov Cassegrain telescope, which is great for portable visual astronomy, uh, especially on, on planets, but also on Deep Sky objects. You have, of course, the RUMAC design, with the collimatable secondary mirror, and you have also the very nice microfocuser there. So if you're interested in visual portable, right, and you were looking at a Maxtoff Cassegrain, this is definitely a very strong candidate, especially at the sale price. Even at the full price, I would say, like, this is a strong candidate to um, an alternative to the, uh, I think, $700 or $600 Skywatcher a 127 millimeters uh, max stuff because, because it has the RUMAC design, it has the microfocuser, and it has the reducer as well, which lets you do some uh, high focal length astrophotography on deep space objects like galaxies kind of as a bonus. But if you're looking something dedicated to astrophotography, to deep sky astrophotography, no, this is not the telescope for you, right? Just Go for something else. Go for a Newtonian. If you get a Quattro 150p or 200p and you mod it, especially the focuser, you can get excellent results. Probably like especially the, the Quattro 200p, once you've modded it, you'll have something that is has the same focal length, has faster focal ratio, and is much less portable, but it's better for dedicated astrophotography. But still, I think this is this surprised me. I, ex I expected to get much worse results, to be honest even on a small sensor. One thing as well, of course, is that if you're going to use it with an APS-C size sensor, that's not going to work. You heard how guiding was a, was a problem for me. So yeah, larger sensors than the 533, forget about it. Like completely forget about it. The 533 would be the absolute limit, in my opinion. So with that, is that something that you'd be tempted by? Or is this something that just is not interested to you because you don't do visual? or you already have all of the visual equipment that you need, and this is not a dedicated astrophotography telescope. Let us know down in the comments. While you're there, please like the video. It really helps the channel out and to make those detailed reviews as much as I can. Of course, if you're planning on buying anything from SV Boni, Amazon, Highpoint, Agena, etc., if you do so after clicking one of the links in the description, it will help me out at no cost to you. And you can sponsor the channel directly as a channel member, as a Patreon supporter, link in the description. As always, thank you so much, guys, for your support. But with that, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget, whenever you can, to look up at the stars. And I'll see you next time.